All right. Thank you for coming to the TAFAC conference. Uh, today I'm going to be talking to you about Clatcher Craig, a major Pictish hill fort in Fife. So just as a bit of background, we're looking at the Pictish kingdoms in the 7th century AD. And this is a map of Northern Britain, Scotland in that time period or the 7th to 8th century cent centuries onwards, uh, with the Picts occupying a large part of Eastern Scotland and Northern Scotland, uh, with the Scots in the West, uh, Britonic kingdoms in the Southwest and Northumbrian uh, Anglo-Saxons in the southeast. So a real mixing pot of different identities, different groups in this time period. Now the Picts themselves first emerge in late Roman sources as these troublesome groups that cause havoc north and south of the Roman frontier. And over the last 10 years or so, at the University of Aberdeen, we've been running a project called Northern Picts, looking at the northern territories of the Pictish kingdoms, um, looking at a whole series of different elements of Pictish society, but two elements in particular, forts, which we know were major uh, social and political centres in this time period, and also the famous carved stone monuments of the Picts, symbol stones, cross slabs and trying to put those in context through archaeological fieldwork. Now, over the last couple of years, particularly as part of our new project, Comparative Kingship, we've been looking southwards at the areas of Pickland um, from Angus down to, to Fife. And it's some of that work that we, we'll uh, talk about today. So that work has included uh, teaming up with with uh, Scape um, to investigate uh, the Weems Caves um, and also working with Mark Hall and other colleagues on interpreting the, the Tulloch Walker, this fantastic new picture stone that came up a few years back, um, and also working on uh, Fort sites as well. This is Craig Rock and, and Fife as part of uh, Zach Hinckley's PhD research, who identified this as a, a probable early medieval site, which we confirmed with excavation um, over the last few years, showing this was occupied in the 6th and 7th centuries AD. So contemporary with Clatcher Craig, which we'll come on to in a minute. Now, a lot of our work, as I say, is part of this new project, part of Kingship which is a Leverhulme Trust funded project um, and has been going since 2017. You've got a few more years to go. Um, and this is a comparative project looking at early medieval society in Ireland and Scotland through a series of, of case studies. Um, there's a number of work packages in this, which includes uh, overviews of the historical and archaeological evidence from these different case studies and also new fieldwork on various um, central places or fortified centres of this time period, including our work in Northern Pickland at Burghead, uh, Cashel and Dunseverick in, in Ireland. Um, and also we have uh, an environmental strand to this with Samantha Jones' work, looking at the environmental impact of some of these centres and polities in the early medieval period. But it's really the, the last element of, of our new project that I want to talk about today, and that's been redating uh, major sites um, and archive projects through new uh, radiocarbon modelling. And in particular, um, using Bayesian modelling, uh, working with Derek Hamilton at Zurich to provide new chronologies for, for sites that have been excavated um, many years previously and don't have very secure uh, radiocarbon uh, chronologies. Um, and through this, the dating, we sh should allow new possibilities for comparative research, um, trying to increase, for example, the number of samples we have for 
early medieval Scotland, which is still quite small compared to other regions such as Ireland or Anglo-Saxon England. Now, the site that we have been focusing on in the last year or so is, is Clatcher Craig in Fife, um, which was excavated uh, back in the in the 50s uh, and not written up until 1986 with Joanna Close Brooks' excellent article on the site that brought together the evidence from, from the excavations. Uh, in this article, a uh, broad 68th century chronology was proposed for Clatcher Craig. Um, and this is or was a major um, uh, complex fort uh, overlooking the Firth of Tay in north, uh, northeast uh, Fife. Uh, during the excavations, um, a number of shards of, of e-ware were found, uh, 7th century pottery from, uh, from France, uh, a silver ingot, and also uh, an important metalworking assemblage, including a number of moulds for triangular and rounded terminal brooches. Um, the multi-violet defences where um, samples were secured showed that they dated to the early medieval period, uh, in contrast to previous assumptions that this was an Iron Age fort. And certainly this was um, one of the most uh, complex forts of this time period, it had at least seven lines of, of defence. Um, the most ramparts, I think, of a site of this uh, date. Um, and overall, the ramparts enclosed around about two hectares, although most of that would have been taken up by the ramparts and by rocky outcrops. So there's about 0.7 hectares actually of uh, particularly usable space within the enclosure, but still a very impressive fort, uh, as you can see, comparing it to some of the others known from early medieval Scotland, such as Denad, uh, Mother Tap and King's Seat. Um, as I say, it was located in uh, northern Fife, north northwest Fife, sorry, I should have said, um, overlooking the, uh, the Firth of Tay in an area that's quite quite interesting in terms of early medieval archaeology. It's just a few kilometres away from Abernethy, the major uh, ecclesiastical centre uh, of the southern Picts, um, which would be broadly contemporary with uh, the fort at Clatcher Craig. Uh, just next to Clatcher Craig was Mayor's Craig, uh, another um, uh, um, uh, prominent uh, landscape feature in which uh, a chapel uh, was identified. Um, an early Christian handbell came from here, and there was also records of, of long kiss burials. Unfortunately, that was also quarried away, as was the fate for, for, of Clatcher Craig. Uh, Nearby is the Mugdrum Cross, a very impressive uh, carved stone monument of probable 8th, 9th century uh, date, um, which may have been located in one of the uh, boundaries of Abernethy. And nearby Lindor's um, uh, uh, class 1 monument, a symbol stone, a picture symbol stone, uh, has been found, and there's also another one from Abernethy itself, and various fragments of uh, cross slabs and other early Christian sculpture from Abernethy itself. So a rich landscape of early medieval activity in the wider um, area of Clutcher Craig. Um, so quite a sad tale of destruction at Clutcher Craig. Um, this was a really prominent landscape feature, um, which included this really impressive geological feature that the high post, which was a, a, a pinnacle, a rock pinnacle, about uh, almost 30 metres high, uh, which was destroyed in 1846 for um, the nearby railway line. And then the fort itself began to suffer the same fate. Uh, there was applications to preserve it between World War I and World War II, um, but those were unsuccessful. And the project um, or the goals of archaeologists at the time turned to mitigation 
with excavations by Roy Ritchie in 1953 and 1954, and nine weeks of excavation by Richard Hope Simpson uh, in 1959 and 1960. Um, but unfortunately, this is what the site looks like today. Clatcher Craig is completely gone, not any, any fragment of it remaining. We did look uh, to see if there was anything we could actually do in terms of field work here, um, but the the quarry has entirely removed the fort and any exterior uh, defences. So a large void overlooking uh, modern day Newborough. Um, the ramparts were impressive, uh, were, were uh, identifiable, they were at least three meters, four meters uh, thick, uh, and still stood up to two meters high in places. Rampart two, one of the interior ones, uh, reused Roman uh, masonry from near nearby Roman fort of Carpau. Um, and the inner ramparts, certainly, uh, were, were timber laced um, uh, with large oak timbers used to construct these impressive ramparts. And there was clear evidence for the destruction of the fort by fire with the ramparts one to three, showing clear evidence for the destruction of the timber lacing and the collapse of the ramparts. Inside, there were traces of buildings, um, principally in the upper citadel, uh, where uh, floor layers, and a hearth um, uh, seems to represent a building round about nine metres by, by five metres wide in maximum extent, uh, perhaps similar to the building or the hearth at least found recently at uh, King's Seat uh, uh, near Dunkeld. Um, here the floor levels of the building survived, uh, various levels, and these floor levels uh, incorporated and overlay, in some cases, the important metalworking assemblage from Clatcher Craig, which included a series of moulds, um, uh, a heating tray, and silver ingots, and other elements of metalworking uh, production uh, evidence. Um, and the two shards of e-ware known from Clatcher Craig, Craig came from round about um, the, the, this, this building. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of the chronology of this building, uh, the brooch moulds uh, were these triangular terminal brooches and rounded terminal brooches, and these were argued by uh, Stevenson to be 8th century or, or later based on uh, typological um, arguments with these brooches, um, derivatives of things like the um, uh, Hunterson brooch. Um, and these were thought to be late in the sequence. Um, so overall, the chronology proposed by Joanna Close Brooks drew on uh, the radiocarbon dates, which were quite wide errors uh, with these early radiocarbon dates, uh, and drew on the artifactual evidence from the site as well. Uh, and quite a complex sequence was proposed with prehistoric activity represent, represented by Neolithic pottery and the carved stone ball, and then perhaps Iron Age and Roman Iron Age occupation of the hill uh, with the first rampart, ramparts uh, one and three, uh, constructed in the sixth to seventh century AD, and then ramparts added to, uh, to those defences after um, the destruction of some of the early uh, defences. Uh, and then there was a, a thought to be a phase in the interior associated with, with the e-ware, uh, and then uh, a, a new phase of, of defence, including the construction of Rampart 2, uh, which was thought to be relatively late in the sequence because it didn't follow the same line as the other, other defences or didn't really follow the natural topography either. Um, and as for the building, it was thought to be later than the 8th century um, because uh, it incorporates some of those moulds that were thought to be 8th century in date and could have been as late as the 12th century um, based on this uh, chronology. 
So as I say, the original radiocarbon, uh, radiocarbon determinations were very wide uh, errors um, based partly on, on oak charcoal and mixed charcoal, which is not something we uh, tend to date today. Um, and they gave wide error margins of plus or minus 55 to 75 years and a spread of almost um, four or five centuries. So a range from AD 390 uh, in the late Roman Iron Age through to 880 in, in the ninth century. So a really broad range. Um, so telling us that this site was early medieval, but not much more than that really. <clears throat> So for redating, uh, we focused on uh, the bone assemblage um, because the charcoals were mainly large diameter oak timbers, which were likely to give old wood effects uh, on, on the dates. Um, and of course, these, these animal bone dates provided uh, terminus post quems and anti quems uh, for the deposits in question, uh, depending on the stratigraphic position. Um, but because we were able to get sequences through the ramparts, so for example, here in rampart one, we were able to date uh, layers below the rampart, perhaps old ground surfaces, uh, perhaps preparation layers prior to the immediate construction of the ramparts. Uh, and we had dates from the rampart core, including the original charcoal dates that were able to be constrained by um, the stratigraphic relationships and the Bayesian modeling. Um, and then finally, dates from the upper deposits that might refer to uh, destruction uh, of the fort or perhaps use um, uh, of, the, of the fort. Um, uh, so this provided sandwiches of dates and dating sequences through the major elements of the fort, uh, the inner ramparts, and also the floor layers of the building, where again, we were able to date um, layers within the building itself and then what appear to be abandonment to layers above, above the hearth. So what sort of chronology did that produce? Well, <laughs> the dates came back as, as a real surprise, really, just in terms of how tightly um, focused they were uh, and really centered on the early uh, 7th century AD with, with with no exceptions apart from one date that appeared to be uh, residual uh, because again it was contained within a well stratified sequence and we could identify that it was indeed uh, res residual. Uh, and using uh, Bayesian modeling we're able to tie the dates down quite cl closely uh, to show that the um, activity in association with ramparts one and two and three, which were the inner ramparts, uh, began sometime in uh, the late 6th or early 7th century, uh, probably in the period 590 to 630 AD, so quite a tight um, focus there of, of a 40-year uh, window. Uh, and the activity took place over a sh relatively short period of time in, in archaeological context of up to 85 years and probably between 20 and 70 years. So two, three human generations uh, at most and, and quite likely less than that. Um, and then the dated activity ended in AD 610 to 690 uh, and most probably in the period 640 to 670 AD. So again, very tight sequence, which is fantastic in terms of putting this site in its uh, historical and chronological context. Now, there was some evidence already that, uh, you know, that the sequence proposed by Stevenson for the brooches and what Joanna Close Brook relied on uh, for Clatcher Craig dating wasn't entirely um, uh, accurate. Uh, so mold fragments from Danad, for example, uh, uh, were uh, had already been dated uh, in the 1990s uh, by Alan Lane and Ewan Campbell to the seventh century. Um, and these were very similar molds to the Clatcher Craig ones in terms of these large triangular terminal um, brooch molds. Um, and uh, Lane and Campbell uh, suggested that these molds were uh, much earlier than Stevenson had allowed 
uh, and um, suggest that there needs to be a rethink of the typology of these brooches. And certainly the Clatcher Craig evidence uh, supports that and again suggests the 7th century um, date for the moulds from Clatcher Craig. So the new sequence uh, from Clatcher Craig, we were only able to date the inner, innermost three ramparts. There was no material recovered or surviving from the outer ramparts that could be could be dated. Um, but the original excavators thought that the, the outer ramparts were very much part of a, a unitary um, uh, process of or in sequence of, of construction wrapping around the in, in the rampart, ramparts, suggesting they were broadly contemporary. And some of the stratigraphic evidence from the collapse of Rampart 3, for example, suggests that, again, they were certainly present at the same time when the fort was uh, destroyed. Um, so the new sequence suggests um, a much shorter period of uh, construction, occupation and destruction, very much centred on the 7th century uh, AD, uh, with fine metal working in the upper citadel, um, iron working in the lower citadel, and this is where the well was located, uh, and then these three timber-laced ramparts, um, broadly contemporary, enclosing the summit of the hill, uh, and as I say, these outer ramparts, probably, again, broadly contemporary, as far as we can tell. Um, unfortunately, we'll probably never be able to tell for sure, I don't think, due to the destruction of, of the entire fort in the quarrying in the 20th century. So the really tight sequence of dates allows us to begin to speculate about the origins and construction of the site, and also the uh, context of the destruction of the site, which I'll come on to in a few minutes. Um, so in terms of uh, the origin of the site, um, the uh, what's quite clear is the uh, dating, which must have, uh, it looks like construction was sometime in the period 590 to 630 AD, 68% uh, probability. Um, and what's, what's also clear is that kind of geographical juxtaposition between Clatcher Craig and Abernethy, um, which was uh, founded in the early 7th century, uh, according to the um, foundation legend. Um, so it suggests that perhaps these these two elements of this uh, landscape in Northwest Fife were perhaps broadly contemporary and maybe even part of a unitary scheme of, of uh, construction uh, with a major ecclesiastical centre and a major um, uh, elite fort built in uh, close juxtaposition. Um, and certainly there's other connections that might suggest that that is the case. So it's really intriguing, for example, that Rampart 2 of Abernethy uh, is built from masonry from Carpow, which we know um, certainly a later period was within the bounds of the monastery at Abernethy, uh, suggesting that perhaps one of the quarry sources for the material was actually from the ecclesiastical centre itself, or certainly groups occupying uh, that area of, of land. Um, now, in the, our sources, there's two nextons uh, connected with the foundation of the monastery at Abernethy, um, and the relationship of these are of these two figures are not quite clear. They may be the same person, or they may be close relations. Um, and it's also clear that this this lineage had close family connections with the north uh, north coast of Fife. Um, so again, it suggests that perhaps there's uh, royal and high status interests in uh, these these two sites, Abernethy and, and perhaps uh, Clatchard Craig. So it could well be that these, these southern Pictish kings are founding a monastery and a major fort in the same area, in perhaps the same chronological uh, horizon. <clears throat> Uh, in terms of the end of the fort, um, we can see that this was quite a spectacular uh, and perhaps tragic end to, to the site. So it was very clear from the excavations that this site had been quite comprehensively destroyed by fire. So all three ramparts, inner ramparts, certainly destroyed by fire, including evidence for 
charred timbers, uh, localized spots of vitrification. Um, so I don't think there's much doubt that uh, this is quite a catastrophic end to Clatcher Craig. Um, and it's interesting if we look at our um, sources for Northern Britain, although we have very few sources in general, uh, what the sources uh, in uh, the 7th and 8th century dwell upon in particular is the destruction of forts through burning, uh, through sieges and other destructive uh, events, some of which are not specified as to how the forts were specifically destroyed. But again, fire may be one of the major contenders for the destruction of these sites. So, for example, Denali uh, in Dal Dalrida, uh, destroyed by fire in AD 685 and again in AD 698 uh, and 699. So a period of uh, less than uh, 20 years, the fort or series of forts uh, destroyed um, by fire. Uh, and then it's again destroyed in AD 701, but not specified how. Uh, and then a fort was constructed new by Selbach, uh, major um, uh, figure in Dal Dalrida in the, in the uh, late 8th century uh, rebuilds the fort in AD 714. So it suggests that a whole series of forts are, are built, destroyed, rebuilt uh, over uh, the space of a couple of decades in the case, case of uh, Denali. Uh, and we can see other uh, examples of the destruction of early medieval forts or attempts to. So Bede, for example, talks about Penda's attack on Bambara. Uh, in which uh, he piled wood high in magna uh, alt altitude uh, against the ramparts. And it was only because the wind changed direction and St. Aidan intervened that the fort wasn't destroyed. So, so a direct reference to the kind of destructive events that seems to have led to the destruction of, of Clatcher Craig. Um, and if we look at all the direct references to sieges, successful occupations, and destruction by fire of forts in the period 640 to 780, in which our, our sources concentrate, um, we can see that there's an uh, episode of destruction uh, and conflict roughly every nine years. Uh, and considering you know, how partial our record must be, this suggests that these destructive events of forts was uh, a regular occurrence, something that happened you know, two, three times or more in each in each generation. Uh, so these were major events, and we can see from the references um, uh, that they were major turning points often in the polities in Northern Britain. So really quite fundamental events in the um, uh, history of, of kingdoms and polities and, and particular rulers in Northern Britain in, in the early medieval period. And in the archaeological evidence, we can also see very similar evidence or uh, supporting evidence for these destructive events. So at Dundurn, there's evidence for destruction of the Dun uh, there. Uh, Al Clut, evidence for destruction of one of the ramparts. And at Burghead, uh, we, uh, the recent excavations there have also shown clear evidence for destruction of at least one uh, part of the rampart in the major Pictish promontory fort at uh, Burghead. Um, so destruction is not an unusual event, but what is quite distinctive about what happens at Clatcher Craig is just really how short the lifespan of this particular fort was. So if we compare that to um, six other sites that have uh, more than five radiocarbon dates in, in Scotland for early medieval forts, which is not many uh, in terms of you know well-dated sequences, but sites like Abbey Craig, Clatcher Craig, um, Dundurn, Dunnolly, Dunad, Mithertap and Trusty's Hill have a reasonable number of dates now. Uh, and what's quite clear about those sites is that uh, the span for, for those is much wider than at Clatcher Craig. It's not to say that some of the older sites might not benefit from um, Bayesian modeling and, and new dating as at Clatcher Craig, um, but even the more recently excavated sites like Mother Tap and Trustees Hill have a wider span uh, than um, Clatcher Craig, which suggests the sequence at Clatcher Craig was particularly short. 
Um, and if we look at the end date uh, for Clatcher Craig, then again, the dates lie in quite interesting uh, time period. So the probable um, destruction uh, happens, uh, or the end of occupation certainly happened sometime in the late, uh, uh, later 7th century, most likely, uh, in the period AD 640 to 670. Um, and that's a really interesting period in terms of this is the decades running up to the Battle of Nechtensmere in AD 685, um, and a period of Northumbrian control over southern Pickland, perhaps most of Pickland, uh, which only ends with the Battle of Nechtensmere in, in, in the 680s. Um, and what we get in the 680s is a series of references to sieges at places like Dunotter uh, and Dundurn, which has been uh, linked to King Brithay retaking um, uh, strongholds in advance of, uh, of the Battle of, of Nechtensmere. Um, and this seems like a possible scenario for the destruction of Glatcher Craig in uh, the the seventh century could have been part of Brathay's uh, attempt to retake in, uh, parts of uh, uh, southern Pickland and re-establish Pictish dominance in 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 the south in the face of this Northumbrian uh, control. Um, but six eighties would be beyond the kind of most likely period for the abandonment uh, of the fort, um, but. What might be linked to uh, the destruction of the fort is is uh, uh, the Northumbrian um, attempts and uh, successful attempts to actually control uh, southern Pickland. So, for example, um, uh, Northumbrian kings in the 650s and 660s uh, are clearly taking over parts of uh, southern Pickland or at least drawing tribute and, and controlling uh, this this region. Um, uh, there's a picture shop rising recorded in, in the early 670s um, under the reign, reign of uh, Egfrith. So a whole series of events that perhaps eventually cul culminated in the Battle of Nechtensmere. And it's maybe in those uh, decades, 650s to 670s, that uh, uh, the, the fort at um, uh, Clatcher Craig was destroyed, perhaps most likely by Northumbrians. Also, again, we'll never, never know for, for sure. Um, in terms of the destruction itself, you know, why, why, why destroy a fort? Um, why not just take it over? Um, well, I think in terms of, you know, a destructive event, um, it is such a major statement uh, in, in the landscape. Uh, now, obviously, you might may have to destroy a fort as part of the actual taking of the stronghold. Uh, but it is interesting that all three uh, of the inner ramparts uh, at Clatcher Craig showed such strong evidence for destruction, uh, perhaps suggesting that this was part of a concert, concerted effort to um, erase this this site from uh, uh, useful um, uh, uh, worth and to erase it from memory, perhaps even, or, or to um, uh, consign it to memory. Um, so it's really interesting looking at the kind of experimental work about burning of ramparts, for example, Ian Ralston's work at uh, East Tullus about how the destruction of a fort um, was such an impressive uh, feature and visible um, particularly at night from, from long distances away. Uh, and we can see that these, these events must have been memorable. The, the burning of, of, a, of a fort like this would stick in the memory as part of a perhaps flashbulb, flashbulb memory um, events where extreme acts of uh, dominance and violence create these emotional situations that are highly memorable uh, and remembered for generations uh, to come. Um, so we can see that the, the destruction of the fort, um, whatever the scenario for its destruction, we can see that it was uh, clearly not reoccupied. So the repercussions of the act were, were such that no attempt was made to reoccupy uh, the hill and the site laying uh, forgotten until its rediscovery um, during the uh, excavations of the 
um, 1950s. <clears throat> So that's uh, that's the talk pretty much over. Um, hopefully you, you will have seen the benefit, I guess, of excavating in the archives as well as excavating um, sites in uh, uh, the contemporary environment. Uh, Clutcher Craig is completely gone today, um, but the archive sources and material in the National Museum is still uh, really valuable in terms of re-looking at this material and uh, creating new um, dating projects uh, and new interpretive schemes for these major monuments through uh, archival work. And that's a really important strand of the Comparative Kingship uh, project. Uh, so thanks for listening. Uh, if you want to find out more about uh, our work on the Northern Picts project, please buy our book, The King in the North, available from all good bookshops. Uh, we have a certificate in archaeology for anyone who'd like to get involved and learn more about archaeology uh, through distance learning. And you can find out about our project through our Northern Picks uh, Twitter and Facebook uh, handles. So thank you very much for, for listening. Um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.